briefly, so again, this is the second week of our Sundays at Night series. Uh, in particular, we're looking at the spiritual disciplines. And last week, Eric taught on Christian meditation. Meditation. Um, thought it would be helpful as you guys practice that over the week. I hope you did. Uh, would anyone care to share about their experience with meditation this past week? We actually had quite a discussion about meditation because we both had preconceived notions of what meditation is. So um, it was a learning process of Christian meditation versus what my and Alfredo's idea of meditation was. So it was very different, even just Bible reading, even in the last 24 hours of what, um, how to meditate on his work. And just a reminder that multiple times in the Bible, the word is used. So I kind of said, we Christians need to take that word back. You know, I feel like the world has taken it and given it a new definition, and we need to take back what was intended. Yeah, I love that. Taking back Christ is King over all things, over meditation. That's our meditation. That's Christian. That's great. And then, toppling any misconceptions. Did anyone have, was anybody encouraged last week of maybe a misconception that they had about meditation? That was kind of, yeah, yeah. Uh, Kind of referencing my very um, intent where, you know, you hear meditation, you get old, you know, um, and that's focusing on the self and spirit, but it's meditation uh, spiritually, it's expanding on that with God and taking the meaning of verse or just listening. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to echo what Angela said, changing our focus from inward, like to ourself, and then focusing on the Lord instead. Excellent. Yeah. Anyone else? Experience with Pastor Heather? I just found, so my process this week was to meditate on the attributes of God. So I'll start with A, on the one, and then B, and just whatever came to my mind as to think of for an attribute, then that's what I meditated on. And then, so first I kind of looked up all the scriptures on it, and then I meditated on it. I did find that it was being kind of new to me, that oftentimes it evolved into prayer because, and I don't think that's a bad thing, but you know, um, because if you're meditating on, you know, the fact that, you know, God is gracious, you kind of then want to thank Him for it. So I think it can be kind of a, a starting point that then flows into prayer if, if that, well, if what we're meditating on seems to connect to prayer. Yeah. I think the lines between prayer and meditation can be blurry. Since it was yeah. <laughs> so, and that's I think that's a good thing when you're thinking about the Lord, thinking about His Word, thinking about His promises, His character. How could you not go and pray to Him, thank Him, and, and speak to Him about that? Yeah. Eric, yeah, two things. Um, one, Heather sent me a resource she used. It was a, a set of Bible verses. My goodness, probably a hundred verses about different attributes of God. Uh, what I suggest. If you would like, send an email to Eric at Creekside.com, and I'll add you to the class mailing list. We're on time to time. That way I can send you resources uh, like that that might be beneficial as we work to do these, these disciplines together. So just send an email to Eric at Creekside.com. I'll add you to the Living Christian Life mailing list. Um, Second, so from my experience, um, I discovered that Bonhoeffer was right. Um, last week there was a slide feature. Bonhoeffer said to pick a text and meditated on it for a whole week. So I decided to meditate on a different text every day all week long. And this morning as I was getting ready for, to come here for church, I was reflecting on the week, and I realized that I didn't have a takeaway from this week of, of chewing on God's Word. And I thought to myself, well, next week I'm going to follow up on that I'm going to pick a text and spend a whole week thinking on it, and, and perhaps that way, and I, I was talking to Danny earlier, and I said, I'm sure that there was fruit. I trust in the Holy Spirit that there was fruit from my meditation on seven different texts. Um, 
this week I'm going to try meditating on the same text all week um, and, and see if uh, that repetition causes it to, to be driven more deeply into my heart. I'd be readily available at me. Yeah, I think you're uh, to repeat what he said uh, for the recording device. Uh, email eric at creekside.com for the uh, mailing list, the class list. Uh, you can unsubscribe at any time by writing stop. <laughs> <laughs> And then thank you for, for the comment about maybe more focused on certain texts or one one thing rather than focusing that and saying on different things. Excellent. Um, very good. Well, before we begin today's topic, which is med uh, which is not meditation, which is fasting, uh, let us begin with a word of prayer and ask God to help us this morning. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for another Lord's Day morning to gather with your people. Thank you for Creek by Community Church and our mission here to make your name known in Gainesville and among the nations. Lord, I pray for your help for me this morning as I teach. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Um, Lord, if there's any distractions in the room, I pray that you would remove them for this hour and uh, anything that I say that is unhelpful or that is incorrect, may it be corrected, it may be forgotten, and uh, may your name be exalted this morning. Uh, please, by your Holy Spirit, be with us, enable us to put your, um, your commands into practice. Um, Lord, protect us from any notion that we can somehow work and do these things to earn her favor. Lord, we, we remember that salvation is by grace and love through faith alone in your Son, Jesus Christ alone. Help us remember these things, Lord, this morning. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, first thing I wanted to talk about was kind of my own experience with fasting. And if you're like me, you don't really have an experience with that. So, um, and it may be dependent on your church background, uh, if you grew up in church, maybe you, uh, I don't think anyone here, but maybe you uh, came out of another religion that uh, incorporates fasting. So I didn't really have much, um, we didn't talk about it as, as a kid, my family, uh, or in our church. The first time I really heard about fasting, well, I'll take it back, I'll say the only time, only thing I knew about fasting was that you weren't supposed to talk about it. So, kind of a movie reference. Uh, First rule of Fight Club, don't talk about the Fight Club. Uh, only if you, you might get that. But So I knew that it was, I, I got a point, hey, it's not supposed to be this public show, and if you're, if you're fasting, you shouldn't be bragging about it, telling anybody about it. But I didn't really have a positive view of, of what that practice might, be, might mean. The first time I remember really hearing about it was, uh, I was in high school, my brother, who was attending the University of Florida, came home. Uh, he was actively involved with crew, and at the time, and one, um, they were planning a summer trip, a stint or something like that, I forget the, the language that they used. And he told me that he was fasting, I guess he broke the, the rule, but he told me that he, that he was fasting and praying in order to determine, to ask God's help in uh, should he go on this particular trip that they were planning. Um, so I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, I was pretty shocked. But, wow, he's actually very serious about his faith. This kind of, this kind of cool. This kind of, I've never heard anything like that. That's neat. So that was kind of my first um, thing to open up to you guys. Um, what, when you first thought of, of, of fasting, what, what comes to mind? What, what is this something that you're familiar with that, that you've talked about or you've incorporated before? Maybe a couple of people. <laughs> Did anybody, I mean, even with a show of hands and humility, have you have you fasted before? A few people, put them down real quick. No so, no, that's wonderful. I, I will just admit, I, it shows me how I fail. Okay. Because with prayer for even for four hours, you know, to be concentrating on the Lord for an hour or half an hour, which would be the time to be, just shows me my short sentence. Yeah, yeah. So Martha's comment was that sometimes 
we see our shortcomings and how we fail, uh, how it can be difficult to put into practice some of these disciplines. Mm -hmm. That's true. And it exposes us a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. Emily? I think I always had this idea that if you passed it, you were just this super spiritual, like, you know, this was like a level that we're trying to get to. Um, the times that I've been successful, it's so about God's strength and vision and not about what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, less about how successful or how spiritual you yeah. are. But more about God's strength in you. We'll talk about that this morning. Yeah. Marilyn, did you have did you have something? Yeah, I was just gonna say there are like you know, different denominations and church, like there are some where I feel like their strength is, you know, or their focus is on Bible reading. And others it's like fact we do fasting like for everything. Like, I grew up like in our church, especially in, like the African church, it was like she fasted for everything. Like, that was just part of the, we're praying, we're going to fast. Like, that was just normal for, for us. So. Yeah. It would, yeah. So cultural backgrounds. Uh, yeah, there are some cultures sure. too, like some, you know, some traditions hold other things higher mm -hmm. in practice, not necessarily you know, Yeah, 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 excellent. And I wonder, we'll, we'll sidebar later about I wonder if that, the frequency of it, or the commonality of it, shaped, maybe, I'm just curious, just thinking out loud, if that made it less unique, less special, or, um, anyway, we can chat more about that. Um, or maybe it didn't, maybe it was always more. Mm -hmm. So, um, interesting. So we all kind of have our own kind of notions of it. Uh, we'll start with some definitions. So, the Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible says this. Uh, eating sparingly or abstaining from food altogether, either from necessity or desire. In medical terms, fasting is the detoxification, I think that word is interesting, of the body through the restriction of food. Spiritual fasting entails setting aside activities as well as reducing the intake of food and replacing these activities with the exercise of prayer and preoccupation with spiritual concerns. I'll get uh, nerdy. Eric uh, rubs off on us all a little bit to some degree. So we'll go Greek here. The Greek word is nesteo, or nesteio maybe is the right way to pronounce it. But that would mean to fast, to abstain, refers to one who is empty. One who is empty. So, uh, and then I think the key here with in terms of definitions is that biblical fasting, differentiating biblical fasting, Christian fasting from other types of fasting which we're talking about, is that biblical fasting always centers on spiritual purposes. Spiritual purposes. So let's talk about some misconceptions because I think we all have, have, have some, if we're honest. So first misconception is that uh, fasting is to... Uh, it's to really to elevate myself. Hey everyone, uh, I'm fasting. Yeah, look at me. I'm cool. Uh, I'm super spiritual, very holy. Uh, you know that's not the case. Uh, in many cases, when we're really trying to do it, like Martha said, we realize, wow, I'm really not that holy. <laughs> I'm kind of messed up. I'm really. This is hard. Uh, I'm not very good at this. So that's a misconception. Another one is that somehow by fasting. We'll get God, uh, our magic genie, to do things for us. And that's just wrong. Um, God is not um, up there, as some people think, to just grant all of our wishes. And if we can somehow be really righteous and good, then we'll earn his favor, and then he'll do things for us that we want. Uh, that's, not, that's not right. Uh, there are other types of fasting, like you might fast for social or political causes. Uh, you might have heard the term like a hunger strike. Uh, hey, um, we're going to make this really public. We're not going to eat until lawmakers do this or that for our purposes. Um, so that is very much attention on me, on us, on our group. So we're not talking about that. There may be fasting for health purposes. Uh, think uh, for different diets. Uh, where your purpose of fasting is, hey, I'm going to get my beach body ready to go for the summer, and I want to look good in my, uh, my 
onesie. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, I didn't want to say bikini, that's not, that's immodest, so. Uh, I think this would also include, uh, so yeah, uh, fitness, there's, if you're, if you're a bodybuilder or a strength athlete or something like that, you, there may be different types of fats that are supposed to help you get shredded, lose fat, look good. Um, there, I've fasted for medical reasons, for before surgeries of different things, so or if you have, you know, um, any kind of exploratory work uh, done. Hey, you, you can't eat because we got to get that camera and check things out. So that's, again, that's not the same kind of fasting we're talking about. I put here as well fasting for vanity's sake. Um, some, I mean, there may be some um, illness that you have that, or anorexia I'm thinking of in particular, or different things like that to make you look a certain way that is really um, not a, it's not a healthy motive at all. It's more of, it, it, I want to, look that way. So, and then I'll unpack this a little bit here, hedonism, uh, which, well, does anyone know what that means? Um, taking in all of the pleasures of the world. Yes, yeah, taking in the pleasures of the world. Uh, John Piper wrote a great book about Christian hedonism, uh, that we should delight and take pleasure in God. Uh, but hedonism here, in this case, I'm thinking of Wow, we live in a time where we have abundance, material abundance. Every, I mean, anything that you want, hey, you can press a button on your phone and Amazon will drop it to your house the next day. Uh, you go to the grocery store, the shelves are full, you have a hankering for a certain food, you can go get it, you can, you can, you got DoorDash, you got Uber Eats, you got Bike Squad, uh, and probably others uh, that will bring it right to you. So we live in a time where we can get anything that we want if we have a desire, we can fulfill it. And even further than that, our culture is telling us, hey, uh, whatever you want, however you feel, go for it, chase it. That's that's all you, as long as you're not hurting anybody else, and they might not even say that, go for it. And that and that's not just with food, uh, you know, deprivation of any type of food, but that's, I mean, in a lot of ways. Uh, think about the sexual revolution, where, hey, oh, I feel an attraction to so-and-so, oh, go for it, you know. There's no, um, why should you deny yourself of anything, right? Advertising would tell you, you need it. Yeah. You deserve it. Yes, yes, yes. And, and that's how, and you need it, yeah. Advertising is, is so, oh, so, if you think about that, it just makes you feel icky, right? How they, how they manipulate and put these messages in your, in your mind. Um, and if you don't do that, you're incomplete. You're not fulfilling your yourself, your calling, you're not being true to yourself. So, this is a very countercultural idea of fasting. Why would you deprive yourself of anything when you can get anything that you want at any time? And again, we're speaking as Westerners. There's, of course, places in, in our country and in the world that what, I, what we just said doesn't really apply, but we're, we're speaking broadly here. Okay, so let's look at what the Bible has to say. That is always a good strategy. So we'll kind of start and work our way through some Old Testament passages. I'm going to have some scriptures up on the screen, and they should be on your handout as well. So if you are, if you have your Bible, I hope you do, you can open up. Um, maybe a few of you turn to some of the other scriptures that are farther in, and I may just call out, hey, can you read, can anybody read such and such? But I'll start with Judges 20, verses Verse 26, which says this, Then all the people of Israel, the whole army, went up to Bethel, uh, went up and came to Bethel and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. The context of this, uh, this particular passage is uh, there's... Um, impending warring and danger, uh, conflict going on. So the, the uh, Israelites are seeking the Lord through fasting and seeking God's help. Uh, can anyone read 1 Samuel 7, 6? So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people 
Okay, so here we see fasting and the crying out of repentance. We have sinned, so there's a sorrow, there's a mourning attached with the fasting, uh, so fasting and repentance. Second Chronicles 20, verses 3 and 4. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid to set his face to seek the Lord and proclaim the fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you, Eric. So we see not just individuals, but also groups, uh, or uh, and sometimes nations that fast together to seek God's help. Uh, let's go to Saul. Uh, the Psalms. We have uh, Psalm 35, verses 13 and 17. If you have it, can you read it out? I've got it. Um, in, in Psalms. 35, 13. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sat on, and I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer kept returning to my bosom. And then 17, uh, Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue my soul from their ravages, my only life from the lions. So this is a, a call for protection, for deliverance, uh, and you see that uh, there is fasting involved. Let's go, I think we've got a couple more, maybe Ezra 8, 21. Okay. I got it. When I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Akaba, that we might humble ourselves before our God, to seek from him a safe journey for us, our little ones, and all our possessions. Okay, thank you, Martha. And then I'll read Daniel. This is kind of a neat section, so I wanted to read the whole section. Uh, so Daniel chapter 9, verses 3 through 19. This is Daniel praying for his people. He says in verse 3, Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer, and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made a confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us, hope and shame. As at this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away in all the lands to which you have driven them, because of the treachery that they have committed against you, to us, O Lord, belongs hope and shame, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord, our God, belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice, and the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us, because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now... O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and have made a name for yourself, as of this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, we work to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. 
O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. I read the whole passage. I thought it was particularly powerful uh, as we think about, wow, what does what being honest crying out to the Lord look like? Uh, coupled with fasting, of course, but wow, I mean, talk about kind of burying your soul and, and just laying everything down at God's, at the Lord's feet and saying, hey, this is not out of our righteousness, but this is because of your, this is for your name that we're doing this. Please have mercy on us. Please forgive us. Uh, so I thought that was very powerful. Uh, so that was a little snapshot of some different uh, passages in the Old Testament. We'll see different ways or different um, kind of reasons or purposes for fasting. So you know, deliverance, uh, danger, repentance, so some of the different things. Now, there are some problems, though. And I think it's, it's fair to say that, that people of God do not always fast in a way, in a manner that was acceptable before the Lord. And God has, some things, God has some things to say about when fasting is done the wrong way. So we'll, let's all turn to Isaiah 58. And I want you to hear, there are some warnings uh, here. So let's, let's think of that. Isaiah is before Jeremiah. And chapter 58. And let's read, um, let's just read it quickly. So I'll read it here, Isaiah 58, 1 to 10. Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Verse 3, Why have we fasted, and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves, and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure, and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel, and to fight, and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to, to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? We'll stop there, but what's going on here? Any thoughts on the hypocrisy? <laughs> hypocrisy, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and there's some rhetorical questions here. Um, are, you really, are you really seeking me? Uh, God says, you're doing this, you're fasting, but then on the other hand, you're abusing your workers. Uh, it, it just, it's total hypocrisy. They're, they're, they're living one way, or saying one thing, and they're doing the exact opposite. And uh, basically the result is that God is not, is not listening to them. He's not listening to their cries. And then uh, Jeremiah 14, 10 to 12, um, basically it says, I'll just read, but the, the key part here is it says, uh, though they fast, I will hear not their cry. I will not hear their cry. So again, God is uh, dealing with this hypocrisy through the prophet Jeremiah saying, you, you might be fasting, this, but you're not doing it the right way. You're not honoring me in that. You're being hypocritical. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not, I will not hear their cry. And then uh, Zechariah 7 Four through seven. And we were all reading Zechariah this week in our quiet times. So seven four to seven says this. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me. Say to all the people of the land, increase when you fasted and mourned in the fifth month and in the seventh for these seventy years. Was it for me that you fasted? And when you eat and when you drink, do you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Were not these words that the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and prosperous with her cities around her and the south and the lowland were inhabited? But again, kind of these rhetorical questions. Were you really fasting for me, for my sake? So uh, the key here is 
what are our motives? What are our motives? Okay, remember from the first one of the first slides, the key is that fasting the purpose is for spiritual purposes. Alright? Not for ourselves. Um, the resources that I looked through here gave me some good information um, to read on the topic. But we started to see kind of the, the years between the Old Testament and New Testament, kind of a corruption, a further corruption of fasting. So uh, the, the rabbis of the day, uh, tradition started to take root, and fasting became more of a meritorious work. Hey, let's, how can we kind of earn God's favor? There were certain days of the week that were uh, that were required to fast, and then I read even uh, other people, some some groups of, of followers of God would say, "Well, hey, that group over there, well, they're fasting on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so we're going to do it on Wednesdays and Fridays." You know, <laughs> as if somehow that's going to do something. I don't know. But it was very, it was just not, yeah, not good. Uh, these were very ritualistic, um, so it's like. You know, okay, I got it on my calendar, and I'm just going to do it and get it done, kind of a thing. And I think we see that, you know, we can see that playing out in our day, too. It would be very easy for us to fall into that trap. Uh, and then, again, uh, one of the things, and I think this is good, and I think we can recapture this idea, and we'll talk about it soon, but the idea of fasting this mournful sadness, as long as it's a bad thing, um, we'll hear from Jesus in a moment of what uh, he has to say about that. But there is, we have a, a godly sorrow over our sin, and I think it's right to respond uh, to God through prayer, through confession, through fasting for that. Um, but there's also a joy because we have Christ, so um, I'll get ahead of myself here. So let's go through a couple passages here. Luke 2.37, so this is some, some examples of fasting in the New Testament. So here we have Anna. Luke. So Luke 2.37, and then if somebody can look up the next verses as well. Luke 2.37 says, And then as a widow, until she was 84, this is Anna the prophetess, she did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at the very hour, she began to give thanks to God and speak to him of all the way for the redemption of Jerusalem. So here we see that. Uh, fasting is a form of worship. Fasting is worship. Anna was worshiping the Lord through prayer and fasting. Again, we see those two linked together. Who has Matthew 4? Let's read verses 1 through 11 if you have it. You can read it out loud. <coughs> then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he entered and said, It is written, Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, sent him up the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you shall serve. And the devil left him. Thank you. Okay, so what do you see here? Is, so first of all, so, so Jesus is led by the Spirit. Uh, it came up, I, was, I asked my wife this week, why did Jesus, why did he go out anyway? What was the point? He didn't go out, set out to go to fast. He went out because he was led by the Spirit, and then he fasted as a result or a way to combat the temptation from Satan. Uh, what is, so in addition to the fasting, but what is one way that Jesus... Uh, also, kind of counteracts or combats Satan there by quoting scripture. Exactly. So I think we have to, when and same with meditation, when we're fasting, when we fast, the scripture has to be in the forefront of our minds. So we'll get we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit as well. 
he quotes Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, which says, and he, uh, and he humbled you and let you with hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every <coughs> word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Okay, Mark, uh, Matthew 6, 16 to 18. And whenever you fast, do not throw on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance in order to be seen fasting by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you fast, annoy your head and wash your face, so that you may not be seen fasting by men, but by your Father who is in secret. For your Father who sees in secret will repay you. Okay, uh, thank you, Jim. So there we see uh, this condemnation by Jesus of uh, fasting as a display of outward piety. Uh, and then he gives fasting a new meaning uh, that it's about service to God as a matter of the heart. Uh, and it, it reminded me of how Jesus kind of doubles down on, on the Old Testament commands where he would say, You've heard it said, but I say to you, and he gives added meaning. He doesn't negate the meaning but he gives uh, added meaning uh, and kind of restoring what's said. Uh, let's, I do want to read this one here, Mark 2, 18 to 22, if anyone has that. Uh, now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. The people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bride is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of my trunk cloth in the garment. He does the patch tears away from them, the new from the old, and the worst tears away from them. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for the fresh wine skins. So, this one's interesting. So, Jesus is saying here, I think, uh, there's, a, there's an aspect of, uh, I talked about kind of this mourning and this sadness, and Jesus is contrasting that with, hey, I'm here with you now. You should be, we should celebrate. The bridegroom is here with, with his people. Uh, so, there, there is an aspect of uh, fasting. We have this joy because... God is with us by His Holy Spirit, so we can do this. Um, we wash your face. Don't look like you're having the worst time of your life. Um, remember that you are filled. You are involved by the Spirit of God and encouraged and empowered to uh, go through a fast and be okay and grow closer to Him and connect with Him. Uh, I've got a Luther quote. So I put the Thug Life glasses. That's that's another air <laughs> Martin Luther said, it was not Christ's intention to reject or despise fasting. It was his intention to restore, to restore proper fasting. Okay. Uh, there's a couple other passages here. I think we're going to skip past those. But um, briefly, Acts, Acts 9 is the solemn road of Damascus. Um, he, he fasts after his encounter with Jesus. But it's, I, wouldn't, I don't know if it's exactly the same thing. Um, he didn't speak or do anything. I think he was just so overwhelmed by the glory of his encounter. So I thought we'd talk about it, but um, think about it at all. And then, and then, chapter thirteen, we see uh, uh, leaders of the in the New Testament church uh, who are fasting and praying as they go to choose and commission uh, other leaders. I think in particular, is talking there about Barnabas. Um, so they pray and fast over the selection of the leaders in the church, and they send them out with more prayer and fasting. So, um, okay, here's an interesting one. Is fasting a commandment? What do you think? Any thoughts? No? No. Alright. So, I think I agree. Um, it seems that fasting is a good thing. Uh, nowhere does, does
the Bible explicitly say, thou shalt fast. We don't have exact instructions of how to fast. We have some guidance, but we don't have exact instructions. Hey, do it this way, do it this often, uh, don't eat this, you can't eat that, whatever. So in matters like this, I think uh, I wrote, uh, we added here, um, Matthew 6.16, Jesus is saying to his disciples, uh, or to, to his followers in the Sermon on the Mount, when you fast, blah, blah, blah. So the implication is that people are fasting, so they're doing it. So he is, again, like Luther said, trying to restore a right view of how to do it. Galatians 5.13 is the verse that uh, came to my mind. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. So I think this is a matter of Christian liberty and conscience in the end. Uh, how to do it. We don't want to heap burdens on each other as believers, as brothers and sisters to say, hey, oh, you didn't fast last week? Oh, you're not holy. You know, you need to grow in your Christian walk. Uh, we don't want to beat each other over the head with, with this. Instead, we can encourage each other with this. Uh, two comments, Marilyn? Yeah, I just... Um I feel like fasting is so important, though, and that there are people in here who have struggles that that they have not seen breakthrough because they have not fasted and done so with the determination that they're going to get through this. And so, like, so no, it's not a commandment, but it is a, it is dire. If there's something in your life where year after year after year, or even your children are not saved, then you need to get on your knees. You need to fast. Need to pray. It is, it is a serious issue. Like the weapons of our war, war, warfare are not of the flesh, but are, you know, like I don't know, just like yep. Kwando and I were just talking about this the other day. Like sometimes what you need to do is fast. That is the only thing that you can do. And so I'm just worried that we might come out of this and think, oh, you know, it's like it's fine to do it, you know, whatever. But it's like no, sometimes you need that determination. Like. Lord, you said this, and I'm not seeing this in my life. Yeah. And going, going to battle with the Lord in a good, in a, in a, in a, in a humility. And I feel like at the church that I grew up with, that was a like very like, common. Like we're going to wrestle with the Lord on this thing because this is something that needs to be fixed. You know. And so like I would just encourage like if there is something in your life, if your child is not saved, like fast for them. John Piper, he said in one of his podcasts, when was the last time you prayed for your, your child's salvation? And I was like, I have never passed asking for my child's salvation, but she's only three. So, you know, like, it's time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, like, it just, like, it is such a conviction that I need to fast for my child, for my children, for their salvation. Why is it not important enough for me to, to, to beg the Lord for their salvation? And I hope that you guys, as you leave, um, as we leave this hour, you will feel like Marilyn fired up to do this. Sorry, like, yeah. I know, I get Sorry. very intense, but it's just like, you know, like, yeah. that was just really like, I pray for everything else, and like, this is the most important thing yeah. that I want for my children. In a way. Like, they're sick, like, they know the Lord. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. ask for this. In a way, it, 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 is a, it is a weapon, a spiritual weapon, like prayer can be um, a proactive way of seeking the Lord, depending on Him. Um, I said there were two, I think we're going to keep, we're going to truck forward, okay? Um, we'll get to some, a little bit more practical matters here, but I do want to try to get a few minutes maybe at the end to, to discuss some things. So, what kinds of fasts can there be? So, uh, in 2 Corinthians 11, 27, I don't, think, I don't know if I wrote on the handout, but Paul mentions that he fasts often. Okay, so we can follow the example of the Apostle Paul. There are holiday fasts in Scripture, in particular, you see one with the Day of Atonement. So they would fast on that day as a reminder of, of sorrow, of sin, and uh, the need for atonement. There are corporate fasts. Uh, again, we see uh, different groups. We read a few passages in, I won't read it, but in Jonah 3, uh, all of Nineveh, uh, there's a fast that's ordered, I believe, by the, by the king or the king man in charge, whoever it was. Uh, so they, they fast and, and sackcloth and even the animals. Uh, so, so that's a, a big deal. That was something that said, hey, everybody's going to do this. Uh, and then there are other you know, different types of fast, different ways we can do it, uh, whether it's um, from all food or drink or certain kinds of food.
Can we fast from other things? So again, open the floor. Is that something? The scripture suggests that. Is that a good thing? Are there other things we might fast from? What do you think? Well, I guess since you're asking, my mind doesn't go to like the uh, liturgical tradition of Lent, where people fast from various sorts of pleasures and distractions, yeah. unrelated to food or drink. Right. So Lent, uh, where we might give up other things. <coughs> so I, I as I kind of prepare for this, I don't. As I look, like, you know, if you just look up fasting, everything in scripture, I think that you see, and I'm willing to be challenged on, is related to food. But I do think there is something healthy connected there of giving up other things for the, for similar reasons. Um, we break that dependence on whatever material thing it is, helping to train our hearts, our minds, our spirits to rely on God. When we have that, that urge to go to social media or whatever you might have chosen to give up, it's a reminder, hey, why am I doing this? Why am I forsaking that thing? Let me go to the Lord and seek Him instead. So I think it's, I think it's uh, while not directly on the review, I think it is related, and I think it's a good thing to do as well. So uh, we'll go through this, and I think some of this will touch on, on Marilyn's comment, which is excellent. But how might fasting inform us? So fasting will reveal things that control us. Uh, First, First Corinthians six twelve says, "All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything." And then uh, later in the chapter, Paul says in the verse in chapter nine twenty seven, "But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified." So that the passage there suggests the idea that the body we should make the body a slave, not to our own desires, but to to Christ, to His desires for us. Uh, and then also came to mind kind of cap capturing, every, taking every thought captive uh, for Christ. So, but fasting will reveal things that really do control us. Like if we if we are really really struggling to not eat for a day or two or whatever however long you decide to do, wow, maybe that's okay. Maybe that you found an idol that you have, and maybe you've uncovered that. Um, very important is that a, a reminder that we are sustained by God. Uh, I, Hebrews 1 verse 3 says that the Son of God upholds the universe by the word of His power. Can He not sustain you through hunger pains, um, through withdrawals of caffeine, of, of whatever? <coughs> he can sustain you there, and we know even more so that He'll sustain us spiritually. Um, we have a uh, fasting may form in us uh, an increased desire uh, for the Word of God. And again, think back to Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Uh, he relies on Scripture to fight uh, the temptation, and he says that man will not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So we must depend upon God, go to His Word for strength, for sustenance. And a time of fasting may increase in us a desire to be in the Word um, and communion with the Lord. Every time our stomach might growl, we can be reminded that we have a full belly. We have spiritual fullness in Christ that we're found in Him. Uh, he meets every spiritual need. <coughs> and uh, so perhaps our hunger would remind us of our lack of hunger spiritually that we have if we know Christ. Uh, there will be an increased frequency of prayer. If you're fasting and you're not praying more often, you're doing it wrong. Increased frequency of prayer. Prayer um, and quietness before God, coming out of gratitude for what He's done for us, for all the things that He's provided for us. Uh, God's guidance in decision making. So we could seek guidance like my brother who saw, uh, and then he ended up serving in Paris for two years with, with crew. It was a really wonderful, formative time, fruitful time in the spiritual life. Uh, him to make that decision through prayer and fasting. And also, uh, fasting may deliver us from bondage to certain sins. And Marilyn, I think you touched on that as well. Uh, if you're really struggling with something, go to the Lord. Just, and not that it's a, again, I, I want to avoid any kind of legalism, but 
is it worth it to you to set aside something for a little while to really seek God and really ask for his help, deliver us from this particular sin you might be struggling with? Is it, is it not a big enough deal for you to, to forsake something for just a little while? So I want you to be challenged by that. Um, one thing and that I thought uh, kind of converse to, uh, to these other more positive things that we might gain from fasting, but fasting could bring temptation, and that's, I think, um, we need to be aware of that, and we need to be careful. Um, I, I even felt that um, this week. All kinds, I mean, different temptations came up, things, weird things, um, but the biggest one was, wow, I just don't want to... Um, I want to avoid any appearance of, of self-righteousness, and but I, but I felt that temptation. Uh, wow, uh, I'm really I'm super spiritual, and it, it's just and that's one of my things I struggle with is pride and how I look before other people. So, wow, I, I think the last thing that Satan would want us to do as believers would be to pursue these things. These are these are spiritual weapons that we can use that God gives to us. Satan wants to do everything to knock us off our path and stop us from from doing these types of things. So just be aware. Um, um, and then, but they'll also be encouraged. Hebrews 4.15 says that we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. He was tempted in every way, as we are, but without sin. So if you're fasting, if you're doing these spiritual disciplines, and you encounter temptation, hopefully that will help you remember Christ, that he was tempted, but he did not sin. And you can rejoice all the more in um, being united with him. Uh, I do want to read this. It was kind of cool. And we are running out of time, so forgive me, I'm going to read quickly. But this was a cool testimony of somebody. He, this person decided he was going to fast once a week for two years. So he planned that out, and he prepared to do it, and then he did. So this was kind of his testimonial of, through the different steps of his uh, fasting. I felt it a great accomplishment to go a whole day without food. I congratulated myself on the fact that I found it so easy. Uh, not a great, but he's being honest. I began to see that the above was hardly the goal of fasting. I was helped in this by beginning to feel hunger. Okay, so here we so yes, he's getting it. He's getting it. I began to relate the food fast to other areas of my life where I was more compulsive. I did not have to have a seat on the bus to be contented or to be cool in the summer and warm when it was cold. I reflected more on Christ's suffering and the suffering of those who are hungry and have hungry babies. Six months after beginning the fast discipline, I began to see why a two-year period had been suggested. The experience changes along the way. Hunger on fast days became acute, and the temptation to eat stronger. For the first time, I was using the day to find God's will for my life. I began to think about what it meant to surrender one's life. I now know that prayer and fasting must be intricately bound together. There is no other way, and yet that way is not yet combined in me. So I think it's a really neat progression of how we started. It was all about, hey, wow, that's pretty cool. I'm doing a great job. Pound the back to, whoa, okay, wait a second. I'm exposing idols, and I'm realizing I can be content in every situation, uh, like Paul, for example. Okay, we'll run through these. I think I've got two more slides. So practical matters. Health concerns. If you have a medical issue, if you have uh, diabetes, or uh, if you're pregnant, do not do this without talking to a doctor. Okay, cool. It's got it out there. Um, make a plan. Decide what you're going to do. Stick to it. Um, you may need to prepare your body to do a fast, so that might mean weaning up or you know working up to it or weaning off certain things. Uh, I mentioned the uh, withdrawal, like fluid and caffeine. Maybe you should like reduce your caffeine intake before you, you know, so you don't have like a crazy migraine all day and you can't do anything. Just a thought. Um, do not call attention to yourself. Uh, I thought about this. It might be really obvious if, if for 10 years, every day you go to the break room with your lunch and you sit there and now all of a sudden you don't have it. Maybe you can go for a walk and instead or do something so that people aren't seeing you, uh, hey, well, why are you not eating anything, Judy? What's going on? What are you doing? All right. If that does happen, think about maybe how you could respond and 
in a way that's not um, making you look super good, but maybe you can encourage that person or kind of explain, hey, this is what I'm doing. You be honest with them. If, they, if they're asking, if, they, if you've been caught, okay? Mm -hmm. Start your fast slowly and end carefully. Uh, in particular, when you finish a fast, let's say you've gone for several days, don't go and eat a huge meal because you're probably going to feel super sick. So just a practical suggestion. Uh, devote the t meal times to meditation and prayer. So let's say you have a 45 minute lunch break. Use that 45 minutes to be in the Word, to be with the Lord, to pray, to meditate, to practice other spiritual disciplines. Uh, you've just freed up a lot of time in your day, so use that time wisely. And then rejoice. I think Jesus is getting at this. We have Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. He's with us. He's in us. So we don't have to be sad. We should, yes, we should mourn our sin, and that may be part of your fast, but remember, you can rejoice. Remembering what God has done, remembering what He's done for you, that He meets all your needs. He meets our physical needs every day, and He fills every spiritual need for us. So rejoice. Remember to rejoice during the fast, even amidst your hunger pains. And then at the end, wow, God, thank you so much for allowing me to do that, for completing that fast. Wow, thank you, Lord, for being my nourishment. Thank you for being my spiritual food. And then, uh, just to get as by that, by means of wrapping up, uh, our takeaways. Fasting is good and normative for the Christian. In your life as a believer, this is something that you should do. Uh, I'm not going to keep on you a burden of how many times. I'm not going to get all super specific about that. Um, but, like Marilyn said, wow, this is really important. For you. Um, I was definitely convicted about it myself this week in preparation. So fasting is good and normative for the Christian. Um, our fasting must be unto God, done out of the right desire to glorify Him. Whether we eat or drink or don't eat or drink, whatever we do, do it to the glory of God. Fasting and prayer always go together. You saw that again and again in the scriptures. So don't forget that if you're not, like I said before, if you're fasting but you're not praying more, uh, I'll get to you in just a second. If you're fasting, you're not praying more, you're doing it wrong. And then uh, remember Christ, who is our true bread and true drink. He satisfies all our needs. While we may lack something temporarily during the fast, Ephesians 1 verse 3 tells us God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. And then remember that spiritual growth comes from God, not our own effort. Uh, Eric said that last week. This is not a way to um, get God to do what, what we want Him to do for us. Um, that is, that you missed the point. Growth comes from God. We just need to make ourselves available, humble ourselves before Him, and allow Him to work in our lives. Okay. Uh, thank you. What questions or thoughts? So, yeah, it was a lot. Um, it's 10.05, so we'll have a few minutes before we dismiss. Um, I have to be, um, is when, when fasting, like, make sure you have a purpose. Uh, when you're going to fast, I don't just, you know, come out and say, like, oh, well, we're supposed to be fasting our spiritual disciplines and we're going to be Fast, just this kind of spiritual thing to do. Um, like my, I, I wasn't sure to raise my hand earlier because the only time that I tried fasting and failed, but that would be um, like the biggest reason was like I was a young teen and they didn't really explain things very well, so I was just kind of trying it to try it to be a good Christian or whatever. And so. check a box. Yeah. Oh, I gotta do it this week. So yeah, absolutely. Any other any thoughts? Questions? Daniel? Um, yes, I, I grew up in a fundamental Baptist church and ironically fasting was never something that we ever talked about or discussed at all. Um, I mean I I had a pastor who talked about eating fried chicken every Sunday his entire <laughs> life. So fasting was not something that I grew up around. My dad 
dad was a chef and I'm a chef, so ironically as someone who works around food all day, I can go 14 to 20 hours without eating and not noticing uh, because it's not important in my life sometimes. And I think that, you know, what, what, what Hannah touched on as far as the intentionality of it, I don't mean to like, you know, lift myself up by saying, oh, I have people to live all day. I can beat myself up a little bit actually sometimes of not caring for myself. Um, I'm kind of curious, being raised in a different way from how Marilyn was, and maybe some others here, as far as how that was such a pivotal role in you know, your culture, and your lifestyle, and upbringing. You know, what are some things that, that I, what are other things that I'm doing wrong? Are there, are there uh, you know, I mean, honestly, like, are there things that I can be doing? Uh, how, how do I go about more intentionally? Tune in next Sunday to find out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, or make that the focus of your past. We could we could do another. I mean, we could do another lesson on on kind of wow, a good theology of food and how do we think about eating and and, and health and caring for your body when you eat. Uh, Linda, did you have something? Um, I haven't done it for for a number of years, but when I was raising my young children um, as an adult figuring out how to work that in. Um, I, I was not raised in a tradition of fasting, but came as an adult to think about it. Um, for me, it helped to take a, a slow day, like the end of Sunday and the next two meals on Monday, as meals that I could least disruptively um, interact with the family in that way. And so um, I guess, in every family, you would figure that out, but uh, sometimes you have to think about how it's going to affect yeah. the other people in the family. So. Well said, yeah. And, and Linda said, brought the point that you're fasting, you've had a family mm -hmm. that might affect their schedules. You might need to think about how you can do that in a way that would maybe have a little uh, smaller yeah. disruption. Right. So if they're not fasting with you, right. or you have small kids who need, they need to eat, right. Yeah. right. And you're cooking for them. Yeah, but yeah. maybe maybe you're not cooking Sunday night and you're saying spouse cook Sunday night, please, if there's going to be something. So. Yeah, thank you. That's a great that's a great one. I just not really thought about how that might affect the household. Yeah. I just wanted to give you a word of encouragement. Is it Daniel? I'm Jennifer. Um, I don't think that you give yourself credit when you say you're doing it wrong. I want you to remember that we are all on a different spiritual journey and even though we're here learning about um, living a Christian life and if the Holy Spirit doesn't speak fasting into your heart and through prayer and you're not being led to do that don't feel like you're doing something wrong right because we're all at different places in our journey and you'll know what you're you know when it's time to you know do the next thing so don't don't think you're doing Good way to end. Oh. I was just going to kind of touch with what she said in, um, in Daniel. I had never in my life, and I, my grandfather was a pastor, heard of fasting um, until I was a teenager, and then it was something that you did to lose weight, to lose something. And then the first thing I heard of it in a spiritual aspect was when I was studying Esther, and they're saying, do this, you know, to be with me as I go for a king, whatever. And so to to try to turn that mindset um, in my journey has been <clears throat> interesting because it's not something that I relate to a game or to a connection with the life. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, hopefully hopefully this has got at least getting you to think uh, and reevaluate your experience with this in life to see how important this discipline can be in the life of a believer. If you have questions about, please come talk to me. I'm by no means an expert. Uh, if you need if you need help uh, about how on more practical matters, how you might start a fast or schedule it, or how many days or whatever, uh, you can consult uh, your physician. You can go to the internet. That's a scary place. Uh, but you might find some good resources there. So um, I think we are done. Uh, look forward to worshiping with you this morning. So we'll see you over. Thanks for it.
Thank you.